Previously, in part one of Sega Game Gear Refurb, we started taking a look at a Game Gear provided by a work colleague of mine. Of course, it turned out that this Game Gear wasn't working as it should. And, as is almost always the case with older electronics, all of the capacitors had to be replaced. In part one, I started replacing the caps on the small power board and then the small sound board with some juicy surprises. Now, in part two, I will replace the caps on the main board and clean things up as best possible. Will all this work bring this Game Gear back to life? Keep watching to find out. Now that we have the smaller sound and power boards recapped, it's time to turn our attention to the main board. There are a lot of electrolytic capacitors on the main board and they look kind of weird because they are all encased in a little capsule, basically a slip on plastic cover, neatly securing these through hole caps to the PCB. Although these are through hole electrolytic capacitors, they're actually mounted to the surface of the PCB. They don't actually go through the PCB making them easier to remove, but first we have to break free the little cap cover, which is glued to the surface of the PCB. There we go. Needle nose pliers make quick work of this. Grab and wiggle and pull up. Here's a closer look at the grab and wiggle technique. Grab and wiggle. And if you listen carefully, you can hear the little capsule break free of the adhesive. And here you can see how the little cover fits around the cap. This is a good point of view to see how these through hole caps are surface mounted to the board. I'm going to use a little bit of flux and my soldering iron with a fat chisel tip. So hopefully I can heat up both leads at the same time and pull off the cap in one go. I've changed my soldering iron tip to a thinner curved conical one so I can get it underneath this cap at C68, which is difficult to get to, but with this tip, no problem. And here I've laid out all the capacitors that I've removed. There are 12 capacitors in total. Again, these are through hole caps fitted into a little cover, and thankfully these covers are well marked with the capacitance and voltage rating of each one. I made a note of each capacitor type required. And I use this as my shopping list to order fresh, new, name brand caps. Turning our attention back to the main board, I've started cleaning up the pads, retouching them with solder in preparation for the new caps. Cue the music. I have been trying, although not too aggressively, to clean off this glue adhesive that was holding the cap cover to the board. Being that this is not my game gear, I've decided to leave well enough alone and not scrape away at the glue on the top of the PCB and move forward with just attaching these caps. But how to do that? In this case, I could trim the leads really short and then do some strategic bending to get them to mount flush with the PCB. Or I could use the dog leg method, leaving the leads long, mounting the cap this way, 
and then bending the top of it around to lie flush with the board. I think I prefer this dog leg method because leaving the leads long and bending them in the middle would probably put a little bit less stress on the main cap body itself. Let's give this a try. Sorry, but I had to do this bend off camera. I had to actually move the camera out of the way so I can get my hands and fingers in there to bend this properly. But you can see how the dog leg bend turned out. A bit unorthodox, but I think the best way to do this. Let's move on to another cap that needs replacing and hopefully this time document my method a little bit better. I've prepared the capacitor by bending the leads a little bit at the end. This makes the component a little bit easier to handle when soldering it onto the PCB. Or that was my thinking anyway. I have to remember that we are bending the leads back on themselves so that the body of the capacitor is resting in the original position of the original capacitor. So it has to be first mounted this way and then bent back. Although now I've just realized something else. In flipping the capacitor around, I have not been mindful of the polarity. I have attached the negative lead of the cap to the positive pad on the PCB. This will have to be fixed. And just like that, our polarity problem is corrected. Now, to bend these leads, I'm using a plastic spudger to try and hold down the base of the legs at the same time and then slowly bend the cap back on itself, like so. The next one is a smaller sized cap to be fit into a smaller area, so I want to trim the leads down to about one centimeter in length. And with the length trimmed, now I'm just going to bend up the ends of the leads a tiny bit so it's easier to solder them onto the PCB. Again, just a subtle bend at the end of the leads. Now I just want to tack these leads in place. Then I will add a little bit more solder to secure them to the PCB. And we can begin our dog leg bend like we've done with the other ones. Now adding a bit more solder. There we go. Nice and shiny. Oh, ugh, amateur. Now the bigger cap at C68 requires a different approach. We had to go more downward dog rather than dog leg for this guy. Okay, so here we have it. All 12 caps have been installed. Not all of them are bent backward into place at the moment. I'll do that shortly. But just double checking the work and everything seems to be secure and the polarities are correct. Always be mindful of the polarity. And here we have it. Lead bending is complete and everything is looking pretty good. All the new caps are fitting in place nicely. All in all, it turned out to be a neat and tidy job. And now that the main board recap is complete, it's time to reassemble everything. I'm going to start with the power board, but before I reinstall it, I want to shoot a little bit of deoxid into the power switch. Feels good, nothing is sticking. Final little wipe, and we can reinstall it.
and I'm finding these connectors a little bit tricky to plug in with the front screen side of the game gear facing down, laying flat on the bench, you have to hold the other half pretty much at a 90 degree angle straight up in order to plug these in. Once you figure out all the juggling involved, it's pretty easy. There we go, all plugged in. Now carefully line up the bottom to the top, lay it down flush, and we should be good to screw them back together. Although, on final inspection, it looks like I forgot the switch cap. Easy to miss, being bright orange and all. This little switch cover just fits over top of the switch. Oh, dang it. Well, it fits over the switch before you install the power board back into the case. So out it must come. Now with that hiccup resolved, we can finally screw the rest of this thing together. And I will spare you another screw it back together montage. Now let's talk hand scum. Full transparency, I am not a big fan. Although it makes me gag to do so, I am compelled to clean it from any handheld device that is adorned with, you know, hand scum. Even if it's ancient, dry, crusty hand scum, as is found on this Sega Game Gear. Dry, crusty hand scum tends to accumulate in the finer crevices of these devices. So I use a Windex soaked paper towel and push it along the crevices with a spudger. This technique does a really good job of picking up all the yumminess. For those of you not familiar with hand scum, that would be the dirty, stinky, sweaty palm grease that scrapes off your hand during heavy gameplay. It accumulates slowly in all the nooks and crannies that get touched and its color is sometimes enhanced by whatever snack you were eating over that time. Classic nacho cheese Dorito dust is a particular color favorite. Hand scum cleanup complete. Let's finally get this thing screwed back together. These are self tappers, so we want to turn counterclockwise until we hear it and feel it drop into place with the original thread and then slowly turn clockwise to screw it all together. Just be sure not to over tighten. This is old plastic. And finally, it's time to test our work. Uh, okay, power LED is on. Screen brightness works. Cycle the power? Nothing. Could it be this cartridge? It's got to be the cartridge. And before anyone yells at the screen, yes, I did clean the edge connector inside the game gear and on the cartridges as best I could with a flattened Q-tip and deoxit. That said, let's see if a freshly cleaned Taz works. Boom, that's better. Sega. Come on now, let me hear some sound. Ha ha. The sound is crisp and clear, and the screen doesn't look half bad either. Certainly a lot brighter than it was. Let's try another cartridge. Columns. Bah, not again. This has to be dirty or oxidized edge connectors. P probably both the cartridge slot inside the game gear and the edge connector on the cartridge itself. Oh, what's this? Signs of life. Ugh, and now dead again. So this is interesting. Has anyone seen this before? 
we get the initial licensing splash screen, but it doesn't go beyond that point. It just resets and reloads the licensing screen over and over. Okay, so I'm convinced it's the edge connectors on the cartridges themselves that's the problem. I'm using a Q-tip flattened with pliers and then soaked in deoxid to run along the edge connectors. You can see the oxidation coming off. Sadly, I've misplaced my tri-wing screwdrivers and can't open the cartridge to clean the edge connector properly. Aha! We have some success. Short-lived success. Come on, give me a break. Work. Uh, work, 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 work. Oh, works. Woohoo! Go Jays! Batman! Okay, Batman Returns is getting a re scrub a dub now. Still oxidation coming off the edge connectors. Here we go. Come on. Hey, hey. The lighter graphics are definitely harder to see on the screen. Even if I turn the brightness up. The scratches on the screen aren't helping much either. Yeah, you sort of got to play with the brightness control and find the sweet spot. That's not too bad. Not to mention it is harder to record the screen under these bright bench lights. I really want to get Sonic working. Let's try again. Ho ho! Yes! Right on! All things considered, the screen looks pretty good. And I can't recall how much better it might have looked back in the day either. But I can see why you might want to install a contemporary LCD mod, like the one from McWill or Benven. I haven't actually seen either of these mods in person, but if you have and you prefer one over the other, leave a comment. Let me know which one you prefer. I have tested several other cartridges and they are all working, so great news on that front. But now I would like to take a closer look at this screen cover or screen lens. It is rather scratched up, normal under regular use, but perhaps we can use some modern techniques to buff out some of these scratches and scuffs. Enter Meguiar's Plastex. Retro Repair Legend Gadget UK introduced this to me in a video oh, probably about five years ago now, and I've been using it ever since. It is fantastic for removing small scuffs and plastics. Add a small dollop to a clean, dry microfiber cloth, then use a small circular motion to slowly rub it into the affected area, applying a modest amount of pressure while you do it. I do this for about 10 or 12 seconds, hopefully covering the area evenly with the same number of circular motions. You should end up with an even coating of a hazy residue. Now let it sit for two or three minutes, letting the Plastex cream dry. Now use a new clean dry section of your microfiber cloth and start those small circular motions again. Hopefully this buffing action will reveal a screen lens with a lot fewer scratches. Believe it or not, this is actually better than it was. Regardless, repeat if necessary. Any better, second time round? Maybe just a bit? Not a whole lot of improvement. Okay, one more time. Well, it does look shinier, but a lot of this scuffing is not coming out with hand buffing. 
I think this Game Gear is a prime candidate for a brand new modern LCD lens replacement mod. On that note, after a little bit of searching, I came across RetroModding.com, a Canadian-based online retailer catering to the retro and not-so-retro handheld consoles mods market. So if you find yourself looking to mod your Game Gear or other handheld console, be sure to check them out. RetroModding.com. I'll leave an affiliate link and an MFR coupon code in the description. Okay, so before I pack this up and get it to its owner, I want to take a look at one more little thing that's bugging me. The AC adapter cable is missing some insulation right up at the strain relief, so I want to fix this before I give it back to the owner. Liquid tape to the rescue. Although I really like this liquid tape product, the brush it comes with, it's like painting with a hedgehog. It's brutal. Okay, I'm going to bring in a Q-tip and try to do this a little bit more neatly. Anyway, once you stop playing with it and you let it rest, it does smooth out a little bit once it hardens. And here it is 24 hours later. Looks much better. And of course, never smart enough to leave well enough alone. I want to give the cartridge slot connector another clean, this time with isopropyl alcohol, and I'll show you how I've been doing it with this long Q-tip and then flattening down the head with a pair of pliers. Soaking that in IPA. And inserting the flattened head into the cartridge slot, moving in and out and along the slot doing my best to scrub each of the connections we're still getting a bit of dirt and oxidation coming off the connectors here's a macro shot of what the connectors look like inside the cartridge port you can get an idea of what kind of a challenge it is to actually clean the metal surface of each of the connectors I've done the best I can, and all the cartridges seem to be working fine now. It's come to the point where I have to get this back to its owner now, and I don't have time to look at one last thing. The Sega Powerback for Game Gear. A kind of chunky 7.2 volt NICAD power pack. It mounts by screwing into the back of the Game Gear, and its power output plugs into the AC adapter port of the Game Gear itself. This one no longer works, as the nickel cadmium batteries inside have seen better days. I'm sure there must be a modern lithium battery mod solution for this, but I'm not sure. If you know, let me know in the comments. And there we have it. That's it for part two of my first Game Gear refurb. I hope you enjoyed tagging along and that you made it with me to the end. I did learn a lot along the way, and I hope you did too. I am definitely not an expert on this topic, but if somebody out there is, be sure to leave a comment and fill me in on anything I missed, or what I could have done better. Thanks to everyone for watching. Please consider subscribing if you're not already a subscriber, and a very special thanks, as always, to my Patreon supporters. If you don't want to do the Patreon thing, but you might still want to support this channel, consider leaving a tip by clicking the Super Thanks button below. Thanks again for watching and thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. And I hope to see you again in the next video.